and it's a little bit of play on words. So first things first is why should you listen to me or care what I'm going to say on this particular topic? And I'm going to give you a little background of my life and my history in getting into Stitch. So after grad school, I worked at a national laboratory, Sydney National Laboratory, primarily very small brands. One was a sustainable clothing company, and the other was a mobile accessories company that stemmed from meeting a guy on an airplane on Christmas Eve. So he fly a plane, talk to people next to him, work out. And at Sandia, we spent a lot of time doing very large scale data analyses, a lot of just interesting problems that we were solving for the government for the purpose of having to make like, rel relatively large budgetary decisions of how it covers our, what's going on right there? <laughs> uh, budgetary decisions for the government. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is the thing that's most interesting to me about that work relevant to what I'm going to talk about tonight is the data that you have is just imp as important as the data that you don't have, and how you do you make decisions in the absence of that data. So, first thing is a question for the group is, if you have all of the data available, if I have all of the data available, I can always predict my inventory and sales in the future with a high degree of statistical confidence. So for any brands or retailers out there, do they feel like this is a true statement, or is this a myth? It's a myth. Does anybody feel like it's a true statement? Does anybody feel like it's a true statement sometimes? So, yeah. what's your name? Alex. Alex. So, if you couldn't hear what Alex said, she was saying that it could come into play for your basics, those consistent styles that you have. Those are oftentimes referred to as evergreen products, and she's 100% right. So, the answer to this is both, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight because. The more data you have, the more historical perspective you have of your sales and inventory history, there are times when you can leverage that data to make better purchasing decisions, to decrease out of stocks, to improve cash on hand in terms of your inventory flow. On the flip side though, there are many times in the real world where that just isn't possible. Even if you have the data, sometimes it's just not possible and you have to make a decision in the absence of that. We'll talk a little bit about it tonight. So, of the two types of data retailers need, simply one is the simple advanced algorithm. So this is getting to what Alex was mentioning. If you have a very sophisticated or moderately sophisticated or actually very simple linear regression type algorithm, you could reasonably predict with good historical sales data, seasonality trends, what is going to sell at what point in time and make better decisions of what you're going to buy. The other side of it is all about the deltas and the easy access. So what I mean by that is what's most important is knowing about the data that you're getting in today, how is it different from what I predicted in the future, or what I predicted would happen in the future, and that is the most important thing. So to talk about that with some examples is evergreen products. So evergreen products, great examples of these would be if I sell a pair of underwear and it's the same pair of underwear that I sell season over season, it doesn't change very much. The taxonomical level that that underwear lives in may be consistent over time, so even if I introduce slight variations or new colors, the products are consistent enough that they're going to sell at a consistent rate that I can predict. Other things that help a lot with evergreen products are things like 4x4 calendars. Is everyone here familiar with the 4x4 calendar? Most people are not familiar with the 4x4, not half and half. So if I explain this wrong, for those of you that know, please let me know, because I'm not uh, as experienced in this, but as a great way to think about a 454 calendar is it breaks the year up into 13 evenly, even day 13 week segments. Four week, five week, and four week in terms of a month perspective. And what's important about that is Valentine's Day is on February 14th every year. But is it in the second week of February or is it in the third week of February? And if you want to compare your sales, in the second week of February from a previous year to this year and what you think, how you think you're going to perform, you need to make sure that the calendar that you're comparing against is actually the right calendar for the type of trend that you're trying to look at. And so properly structuring the way that you just look at your sales, even from a calendaring perspective, will make a big difference in your ability to statistically forecast what you will sell in the future. And lastly is the predictive elements in terms of if you can have the sales history for a product, you are able to write the algorithm that can determine what's going to happen in the future, you will do two key things. And the first of those things is you'll drastically decrease out of stocks. Why that's very important for a brand 
or retailer, it may seem obvious, but anybody that goes shopping and they try to buy something that doesn't exist leads to a poor customer experience. It's something that you always want to avoid, not to mention lost revenue. And then similarly, a lot of brands try to mitigate this risk by overbuying a lot early on. Overbuying outlays your cash, and it puts the brands in a very difficult position that will ultimately lead to them failing. More brands will fail because they buy too much rather than not sell enough. And so the better that you can be with the products that you can predict how they're going to sell, sell sorry, not better you can be, but the better you can be at those predictions, the stronger you're going to be in terms of controlling your cash and what sales you're going to have in the future. The other type of data is different. And I think that this is a, is a very interesting um, component when it comes to inventory planning. But we learned a lot about inventory planning at Stitch in the last 12 to 14 months. And I can tell you that when I went into thinking about well, what is inventory planning, what is inventory forecasting, certainly this is a way for me to be able to build the best forecast possible. It's got to be what the solution is. And as someone that is creating financial forecasts and figuring out you know, what is our quarterly plan, what is our annual plan, the thing that you realize is that the best plan is, it doesn't exist. Because the moment that you create that plan, it's no longer correct anymore because the world has changed. And so what we like to joke around about a little bit seriously is just this Mike Tyson quote in terms of like everyone has a plan until they get hit. Basically, you create a plan, the next day your sales are not what you expect, what do you do? And so, what we find is that the best inventory planners are the ones that can react quickest to the deviations in a plan. I just wanna say it again, like the best planners are the ones that can react quickest. It's this odd thing to be proactive about reacting. It almost seems to conflict with each other. But what you do is you set up a system so that you can react fastest to deviations of what you thought was going to happen. So to give an example of this is, let's say that you are selling those green elephants and it's your first time ever selling them. You're like, I've been selling plastic animals for a while. I'm gonna create one that's green and it, people can sit on it and it's gonna be awesome. And you buy however many you buy and you think you're gonna sell 100 of them in your first week. And at the end of your first week, what do you do? You figure out what and then you make some changes. That's a very easy thing to do with an elephant. But what happens when you have a clothing line where you have 67 styles and those are offered in 13 different colors each and they're coming a whole bunch of different sizes and you're releasing a new type of product that you've never sold before, you've always sold shirts and now you're gonna start selling shorts. How do you manage all of those things at one time? There's no way that anybody has the bandwidth to do it unless you hire an infinite number of people. And so what we find is that in this circumstance, and these are the circumstances of where you have seasonal products, so the things that you only sell for a short period of time, limited editions, you see this a lot in streetwear brands where they'll do a promotion with a celebrity in order to get a product out there that is unique only for a limited amount of time and they've gotta make sure that they sell the right amount of product for the right time. Social spikes, social media, or things that we talked about with the Oprah effect. We have a customer that when they go onto the view, their orders will go from on average one to two per minute to 250 orders a minute. And they'll sustain that for a while as they follow through that trend and they need to make sure that they're prepared. So in these circumstances, it doesn't matter how much historical data that you have because oftentimes you won't have it or if you do have it, it's not relevant enough to what you need and therefore all you can do is infer from that data what you think is going to happen. And so what you need to do is it's all about the systems that you put in place. Those systems are having appropriate taxonomies. Why are taxonomies important? It's because they allow you to group the data in a way that's going to make sense for the decisions that you need to make about your sales. That's going to help expedite the process of looking at individual trends. It's nearly impossible for companies, unless you have very small catalogs, to be able to look at every product within your entire product catalog and analyze all of those in real time. You create a system that understands and knows the deviations very, very quickly. And what we find is, you may say, well, it, it's gonna be easy to understand and recognize those deviations because once I, once I look at the data, once I see the sales and they're different, then I'll know. Oftentimes we find, and we've interviewed many, many different people in inventory planning and analyst decisions, and it, the act of just getting all of the data into one spot so that you can analyze it takes so much time and so much work that by the time you need to make a decision, too much time has passed. So creating a system that will enable you 
to get all of that data in there so that you can focus more on what are the deviations and what do I change moving forward is critically important. And the last thing is, is once again, it's, it's being proactive about reacting. It's accepting the reality that you will never have the right data. And so in the absence of that data, how do you put yourself in a position to make the right decisions as fast as humanly possible? And you build a system focused around that, not around having the perfect plan. And so I'll leave you with this. Um, one of our customers is Chubby Shorts. Is, is everyone here familiar with Chubby Shorts? Maybe not familiar. They're like, well, I love them. They're just hilarious and great and awesome guys and girls that work there. But they sell a product that's pretty cheeky or you know, these short shorts or these like interesting pattern shirts. But when they go do a big sale, like they put up some real numbers. It's, it's really impressive. Like I'm not at liberty to say specifics, but I can tell you that they figured out how to handle their operations in a way that allows them to scale. They figured out how to maintain their evergreen products while releasing new seasonal items and selling them. And what they talk about is having everything centralized. What they talk about is having that quick and easy access to the data to make those decisions far more than they talk about ever having the perfect algorithm. And that's one of the things that's really been able to help them grow and scale. So with that, um, it wasn't the most technical talk in the world. I hope that's okay. I I don't know if this audience wants a very technical talk or something that's a little bit more high level like this one, but I hope you enjoyed it and learned a couple of things, or at least kind of created some new thoughts about what type of data you actually need or why you want that data to run your businesses or whatever it is that you're doing. So on that, I'll be happy to take a few questions. How did you systematically find the data points that indicated the type of inventory you should have and you should pull? For any given customer or how to stitch or how to excuse me. How do you, so you create the, the models basically for the inventories to be held by the client, right? For the, the models? I, I'm sorry. Yeah. So you create certain, you predict what the inventory should be held, what inventory should be held by which the supplier of the clothing manufacturer. So our, our customers would be the brand or the retailer. So in the example of Chubby's, they would be the customer and they're purchasing it from their manufacturer. We would we would create a model or a series of models to say, at the rate that you are selling your goods with the alerts and thresholds that you have for your purchasing and the lead time that it takes to get the product and the reorder points that you want to reorder them, yes, we will automatically predict and tell you. But it's only it only will work well in those ones where it's like a regular stream, a predictable, uh, predictable model of how that product will sell. So like, with, so you had a few different criteria with which you were, you were indi indicating the, the way you should build your model as opposed to the ones that were just right there. Iterate. <laughs> this is the best way of saying it. Um, I mean, uh, if I'm understanding your question, you're saying like. How do, how do we know that we built the right model, or what are the things that go into the model that we consider? Yeah, yeah I imagine there were some that you thought would be really useful, some that you thought that would be would create more uh, noise in your models than you would expect. Mm. I, I don't know if I can speak to one that, I don't know if I can speak to one as much that uh, wasn't as useful. I, I think a lot of it is actually figuring out yes, how to get rid of the noise, and how to deal with some of the real world deviations. So things that we take into account, for example, are you know, the simple ones versus you know, do you not have enough sales to create a statistically relevant answer? There's other things that become more interesting in terms of how you deal with out of stocks. So if somebody's velocity is low, is their velocity low because they uh, sold really fast and therefore it's been at zero for a while or is it because they've just really given up on that product? And in those circumstances, how do you figure out like what you should recommend as the velocity. One of the number one things that we see, so this is what's referred to as an opportunity assessment or opportunity analysis, is a common mistake that people will use when analyzing their historical data, is they'll say, okay, this shirt over last year sold you know, 365 units, so I'm predicting one unit a day sales, but what they didn't realize was that the size large was actually out of stock for two months, and during their peak season it was selling differently. So, you need to be able to look for those out of stock um, times. And then there's other things that uh, we don't do quite as much today, but certainly things in seasonality adjustments. That's all on the model side in terms of what you do for predictive purchasing. When it comes from the planning side, it's 
it's different. It's, it's actually much less about building a model, it's much more about building a tool that allows people to easily create a forecast and then input information that will describe and provide context to why that model is going to perform, why your forecast is going to perform different than a model. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I think you know, you talked about iterating on, on a few different ways, and then also the planning versus the modeling. Yeah, the planning, and then the thing that we don't do is we have to rely on the customer input in terms of, a customer wants to know a velocity number on you know, almost everything, whether or not it's relevant, it's really up to them to determine is this a product that they think is more of an evergreen product that should have statistically relevant data, or is more of a seasonal product, or a product with, that's a new product within my taxonomy that may not have as much. That's more up to them to decide if that's something that they want to trust you with. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can your model produce product recommendations for future purchases or for future buys? You're saying, of, or are you asking, can it, can it tell you future buy in terms of I've been selling this, this is how many more of this I should buy, or uh, you've been selling this, so here's probably other things you should buy? Like, can it take um, the aggregate of, let's say, you have that shirt and additional 10 other SKUs, right? And kind of compare what the velocity of the sales are for those, and then determine either you should buy more of this particular model, but in addition to this, like maybe aggregating across all of the brands, this type of style tends to sell. You should also look at either designing this particular style or purchasing something of this similar cut, fit, whatever. Ours does not do that. I know that there are other companies or other like more advanced algorithms that are looking at a lot more of, what do we call it when you're talking the <laughs> One product is impacting the sales of the other product, we have a term that we use for it. There's, yeah, there's affinity. Um, there's affinity. Our, we don't account for that today. It's stuff that we've talked about, it's doable, we just haven't built it. Is there a certain size business that you're talking about that you It's a good question. Now, generally speaking, most of the businesses that we work with on the low end are doing a few hundred to a few thousand orders a month. That's about the smallest. Uh, we used to serve a lot of smaller customers, and over the years, as we've built a lot of features and functionality on the platform, there are some very powerful tools that we've built that make a huge difference when you're doing 25,000 orders a month that are just like a mere convenience, you know, if you're doing 250 or 100 orders a month. And so it is really geared towards what we consider to be a mid-market customer. I deal range of those businesses that are doing between 100 or 1 to 100 million in revenue, more or less. Okay. And then, under contract, you're talking about upgrading the trend. So then, is it, are companies relying on their own internal employees to then lead them analysis and come up with what the direction of the business should be? Or does your company also provide the service? At this point, it's, it's much more on the business. We intend to add more tools in terms of suggestions over time and providing better tools to enable people to set goals at various levels of your taxonomy and it gives you auto notifications in terms of how you're tracking towards that to inform the decisions. Today and for the foreseeable future, we do not intend to, to make a tool that makes the decisions for you. I would say one of the key things that we've learned is that no operator wants you to decide what you should purchase, or sorry, no operator wants a software to tell them this is what you should purchase and then just make the purchasing decision for them, or this is what new product you need to release and then just figure out how to do it. Yeah, it's all about informing it and it's really a lot more about empowering the planner or the analyst or the VP of operations or whatever role they happen to be to make those decisions. But certainly we do intend to build a lot more functionality to help inform those decisions in a much more proactive what were you rethinking of something in particular? No, I mean, my background was in buying and yeah. for a large department store. And I think, like, we always became very threatened when companies would come in with this type of software and say, well, we can predict these things. Yeah. And then we would always use it for a season or two, and then it was like, done. Like, it didn't help the company because we were also reading it and saying, well, these numbers are wrong because you do get those, like, over mm -hmm. effects.
totally. I, I came from a point, I'd say a couple of years ago, thinking, yeah, like, there's got to be a perfect algorithm for this. And then, actually, even last night, Megan uh, hosted a panel in our office where we had two different people that were, one was a buyer, she's she still a buyer for North Face? Yeah, buyer for North Face, and the other's been an inventory planner for a while. And so we built up this panel of about 10 planners, and I can tell you my sort of pretty strong opinion that there isn't an, actually an algorithm that's going to solve this problem. It's, it's much more about looking at the workflows that planners and buyers and analysts and the people on the, the purchasing side of the business have to go through, and how do you expedite and inform all of those workflows to enable those people not to replace them. Right, but having the right data is like everything. Totally. Then you yeah. can do it all, but it's not just on there. Yeah, it's, it's, I should have put a picture in here. There's this uh, girl that I'm friends with. She uh, She's a VP in sales of Ops. Um, they're like, uh, they're a nine-figure gene company for high teen and young 20 girls. And she was showing me her, you know, her huge pile of spreadsheets for, you know, this is what's, you know, looking at the business this way. This was like, this way, here's my pile of POs, here's my pile, and it's just, that's kind of the state of the world for a lot of companies, unless you're cap. What company did you work for? Uh, I was in Libido. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Do you, ever have plan, do you have plans to go into maybe later like sourcing, supply chain, optimization, consulting, or will you just stop with finished product? Yeah. Um, we'll be at finished product for a while, a little while longer. I know I can't tell you exactly how much, how, how long. The reason why I'm smiling at your question is when we originally started Stitch, we started it as much more of this, almost like base, like, at least in my head it was more. Basecamp esque, it'll be super self serve, easy, everyone will figure it out. And you know, really, what I realized is, okay, that's great if you are dealing with a product that's you know, like project management or tweeting or whatever. Like when you are actually tied to someone's inventory and you change that number and it actually changes their business, it if you mess it up, like you completely fuck their business. It's really bad. Um, or when you yeah, accidentally relist 150,000 Etsy listings in two hours, that kind of stuff. Um, the reason why I bring that up is because of the struggle and challenges of managing inventory, it's amazing how complicated it can be to just make one number go up or down at the right time, is we have found that having a team that's focused on customer success and thought leadership, or working with this panel of inventory planners is almost, if not more important than the software. And so. Do I see ourselves building out more functionality in terms of your supply chain manufacturing, things like that in the future? Yes, I think that's a natural progression. How we do that, I, I don't know. I don't think we want to take the approach that other companies have taken historically. Do I see us also providing a lot of context and education to our customers of how they should think about approaching that and what they can do to make the best decisions there? Um, absolutely, I think we have to supplement it with as much software as we do did that answer your question or is that off base? Okay. So this philosophy of being like proactive and like reactive, like I mean, do you have scaffolding in place so you're not overreactive where you're just like, you know, constantly changing stuff all the time that you have no idea? Like, you know, you have your forecast, but like is there a scope that you guys find that's like a good like standard for setting goals and like sharing data? Or is it just like every day change everything? Um, it's not an everyday change everything, but I can tell you from the, the various people that we've worked at, the best of the best is, is doing this every week. And not every week in terms of drastic changes, but every week in that they have the ability to get all the data that they need, sometimes very painfully, every single Sunday, meet on Monday, and figure out what those deviations are to make decisions that actually will change in the upcoming week. And it's not just the data is the thing. It's, getting the data, talking to the merchandising team, talking to the marketing team, figuring out what promotions are going to come up. Okay, and you're now gonna release this new promotional product because the other one performed well, you even know it, and somehow your manufacturer can get it to you in three weeks. Those are the companies that are best at it. The one that I know of that's the best in the world, and so when you talk about like, are you making decisions too quickly? I really struggle with that one because I think that you can, but the company that I know that's best at this is Zara, at least on a large scale. And Zara makes decisions from, like I don't know if everybody knows this, but 
they'll, Zara will have somebody go to a concert and see, like, I don't know, name some artist singing, and they'll say, that's awesome, they'll take a photo of that, and they'll have a prototype 24 hours later. Three weeks later, some version of that will be for sale in their store so they can keep up with the trend so quickly. And so I do think that for any modern brand retailer, especially if you're working in like fashion, apparel, those types of things, the faster you are at reacting to those trends, the better. Now, there's a good question over here in regards to the supply chain. You also have to figure out the entire rest of your supply chain and how you're going to be able to source those goods as quickly as you need to. But that's a related but different problem than what you're asking for. So philosophically, I don't think it's the right thing to change every day, but I think the best companies in the world are figuring out how to do it every week. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna add one last thing to this as an example of companies that I don't think are doing it particularly well, is Gap for a long time did a nine month cycle. So imagine that. Like, Every nine months, you're, you're shelling out half of your, your cash, or I guess it's a quarter. Um, and they were talking about trying, in their Q2 earnings call last year, we're talking about trying to experiment at six month cycles with some of their products. And like that's where they're trying to get to. And if you actually look at their earnings reports every year, or you know, like last year was the first year in a long time that they had lower revenue than the previous year. So the companies that are doing it slowest are starting to fail. Excuse me? Uh, I mean, you can say that the design suck could be part of it. The other. Yeah, and then this is what I think is so interesting about Zara is that Zara has, has the design, it has the manufacturing. Yeah, but it has the whole, like the whole order of logistics, supply chain, the store, like they have the whole thing just automated. And they invested heavily in doing that. An interesting example, I know you say design, but I don't, um, a company that's not doing as well but doing all right is Target. And Target recently announced how they're gonna spend three years and lose several billion dollars to invest in not a Zara type, but their own type of like, forward-thinking advanced right. type of systems. Yeah, because yeah, they're trying to figure it out and keep up. I just need to Oh, cool, so you know oh, like, way more than that. Yeah, I don't know what the perfect solution is either, but I, I think it's really interesting seeing the companies that have figured out how to move quickly and react to the trends fastest are the ones that looking like they're being the most successful. And a lot of times you find like Zara's in the case, more often than not you find it in the, the younger brands and retailers that are up and coming hungry and are willing to move quickly. You had a question? Yeah, so you said that you're not interested in um, going after the trend portion. Excuse me? Did you say you're not interested in going after the trend portion of inventory management? What do you mean by trend? Like you, are you just working on the basics or are you doing you know, trends like things like Zara for someone who have, doesn't have Zara's capabilities of you know, reacting really quickly, but helping them to understand when is the trend going to die? Because people have to buy six months out and I don't juicy couture track suits, like they died you know, on one day and all of a sudden every retailer that had them was left with you know, tons of inventory. Are you going to try to figure out a way to know when like that trend in general could die? Could be, uh, we, yeah, we don't have trending tools like that. It, for us, we have we have tools that address the two components that I spoke about today in terms of you know, some lightweight to moderate algorithms to assist with the auto purchasing of evergreen products, and then we also have tooling that assists with forecasting and inventory planning and understanding at various levels of your taxonomy, your overall sales history, and how you make decisions moving forward. Speaking more to like fashion trends and how that's going to impact your you know, your future product development life cycle and what types of products you plan to produce, we don't have any information on that. We could someday if it's not a core area of focus for us right now.
we frankly find that just that inventory component is so hard and so messy for these businesses. That's why they need help. We'll probably, it's not the sexiest, but like we're gonna stay there and work on that for a while. What's your like five to 10 year vision of inventory management for retailers? Like, or for brands? Do you expect it to kind of stay the same as it is right now, or do you see a big shift coming? Oh no, it's not the shift, big shift coming, the shift is happening. The world is very different now. The, the general, the way that we like to think about it, or what our thesis is, is that commerce has fundamentally changed and that businesses are no longer choosing how and where they sell. All those decisions are being driven by consumers. And, is, and the consumer expectations also go up a lot. Amazon has contributed to this a lot. But those expectations have gone up a lot in terms of consumers like to shop on the channels they like to shop. Like I like to shop online, maybe you like to shop in store. Maybe somebody else likes an interesting showrooming experience that Bonobos is doing, and other people don't like it. The point is, is that these brands are going to have to cater to the way that, re that consumers like to buy, and they're going to need to be able to deliver their product in the quality and the time frame that those consumers expect. And that has gotten really complicated. And when I see like, technology, when I think about how consumers buy, I only see more new things coming out all the time. And so the way that we shop today, I think is going to be very different than how we shop 10 years from now, but there's still probably going to be a lot of what we do today. Now suddenly, businesses have to be able to handle all of those different components simultaneously. So fundamentally, has inventory management changed? No. You have to have the right amount of inventory at the right place at the right time. But when you've gone from a traditional model of creating a bunch of inventory and selling it to a big box or a handful of them, and that's what you do, rinse and repeat, to I'm doing that plus six different channels online and in-store, and I've got different fulfillment solutions, and I want to run complex workflows with orders and back orders and splitting orders and all this other stuff. Um, those are the types of things that everybody needs and everybody expects, and nobody can get it unless you spend an arm and a leg to get it. So personally, I think it's going to continue to change and evolve. The core will be the same, but the way you accomplish it will be very different. Any other questions? That's it? Probably in time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much, Brandon. So for those of you who want to ask Brandon more questions, um, we still have time after um, our second speaker, Mo. Um, so Mo is the co-founder of Deepen AI, and he's an ex-Googler. He left Google to um, start his uh, machine learning startup. Uh, I'll let him take it forward. Thanks, Evelyn. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Musa, but I go by Mo. Uh, how's everybody feeling tonight? Good? Awesome. Need coffee? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so I'm going to jump straight into it. I was a product manager at Google. Before that, I managed uh, the Google Apps launch team. So I launched things like Google Drive. Google Vault, which probably if you're not an enterprise, you don't know what that is. Uh, I launched Inbox by Gmail, uh, Hangouts. I actually tried to block Hangouts, but nobody listened to me. Uh, and now they're fixing it. Uh, but anyways, uh, now we are doing a deep learning startup called Deepin AI, and our focus is running the AI directly on the edge, meaning the devices that are not necessarily connected. So all of the inference, all of the detection or recognition of objects, ones on a mobile phone or on IoT or a fridge or a microwave or you know, you name it. Uh, and I can talk about that a lot, but today is about retail. So just to get an idea of the audience, who's here actually working in the retail industry? No. <laughs> uh, who's a kind of a designer, creative side of things? Some people are in retail, some people are designers. Who's a developer or doing big data analytics, AI? Awesome. Uh, I'm not gonna ask any more questions. Let's get started. Okay, so AI, it's being used all over the place. You know, different uh, people are using different acronyms. Machine learning, deep learning, AI, uh, uh, machines can invest, etc. 
whatever you can think of it. The way that we kind of differentiate it is that deep learning uses something called neural networks. Um, with neural networks, it's, it's based on neurons. It kind of simulates how the human brain works. And recently, sort of in like the past five years or so, it's got a lot more popular. So even my co-founder, uh, who was a MIT PhD in AI in the 90s, he went, like, he quit Google and just started to study deep learning because it wasn't hot when he did his PhD. Uh, but it got a lot more relevant the past five years. Uh, the interesting thing, a lot of use cases that people didn't think they can use AI for started popping up all over the place. So we're talking to companies in agriculture, retail, in manufacturing, oil and gas, uh, it, it, augmented reality headsets has a ton of computer vision applications. We're talking to a bunch of them as well. Um, the reason I'm here, we actually developed a demo app. It wasn't something that we are kind of, you know, specializing in. We none of us uh, come from retail or fashion backgrounds, uh, but we just wanted to do something quick that has uh, an application. So we made an application. We called it Matching Shop. It's launched on the App Store. Uh, on the Play Store. Uh, and essentially, take a picture of that, that you like, and uh, we'll match it with pictures of outfits in our database. Uh, just for ease of use, we scraped, I think, 6,000 photos from Forever 21. Uh, we just match whatever you take a picture of with an outfit from Forever 21. And we saw a ton of issues. So, I'm mostly going to talk about some of these issues that we faced, and uh, some solutions. We, we're not actually working on these solutions, but we know startups that are doing that, so I'm going to mention that. Thank you, Yeah. Sure. Is this good? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So AI is eating the world. It has been all over the place. Uh, why would you use AI in fashion? Like, uh, for some of the use cases, I guess you guys might be more, uh, a lot more experts than me, so we'd love to learn from you. you know, how is AI being used in fashion other than the statistics and logistics, inventory management, optimizing recommendations for users that are based on statistical data? Like, let's talk about other types of AI. What's the recommendation of that? Mm -hmm. Other use cases? Prediction. That's prediction. Product yeah. prediction. Uh, anything else? All right, cool. The, the, the interesting thing in with, with AI, actually, the reason we started the company is there's a lot of use cases that people haven't even thought of yet. And we'll talk about some of these uh, now. But some of the problems that AI can help with is you go to a store, and your particular size is not available. Or uh, the piece that you wanted ran out. Everybody bought it. Or uh, it's available in the store, like in the Macy's, in the next town, not in the Macy's uh, that, that's next to you. Uh, so there's an issue of availability. Uh, there's an issue of discovery. And uh, like you mentioned, like pairing stuff. You know, what bag goes well with, with these shoes? What shoes go well with this? suit, et cetera, et cetera. And AI can do a lot in this area, specifically computer vision, and that's, that's where we specialize. The thing is there's a lot of issues with AI. So uh, like machine learning, and you know, some questions came up around uh, to, to Brendan about how big of a customer, uh, how much sales do you need to actually be able to provide them with actionable insights that are useful. Uh, AI doesn't work unless you have a lot of data. Most of the issues that we faced in developing our app were data related. So some of them. Uh, this is the, our data set because we focus on Forever 21. It was mostly homogeneous type of data, which is mostly the same race, mostly people in, in their younger age, and they're, they're wearing trendy clothing. 
So if we took a picture of an older gentleman or an older woman, it wouldn't match well with our data set, the Forever 21 story. Uh, and the minimum data set to do neural network training, to get the deep learning network to behave well or to give you good results, is around 10,000 images. Uh, the more the better, actually. Like some of the models that Google has for TensorFlow has 1.2 million images. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, but where are we gonna, because it's a small startup, we don't wanna go in down with 1.2 million images and train a model on them because we're not making money on it. So uh, these cultural differences can be embarrassing. <laughs> My wife wears the scarf, and when I took a picture with her with our app, it thought that she's a man. The funny thing is our accuracy with, uh, with Caucasians is 99.99%. Like we almost have, we never make a mistake if we look at, uh, at regular white Americans. But when we look at people from other cultures, whether African American or Asians or Middle Easterners, we were getting these embarrassing mistakes. You know, so if, if a user uses my app, uh, they are male and they get female results, or female get male results, or other gender, they're not gonna be happy. They're probably never gonna use my app. So that was an issue. Issue here is we need to go and get data for every single culture or race and a lot of images for that, for, for that culture to be effective. Uh, that's one. Second, uh, gender. So uh, if you get a male with long hair, and unlike me, maybe clean cut, or you get a female with a very uh, short hair, or maybe you get someone who has a round face uh, that you know you cannot tell the features of their face correctly. It becomes very, very hard to train a model to recognize these differences and give you good patterns. Especially because like each neuron in the neural network specializes in a few pixels. So when it forms uh, a pixel, like uh, how many people here know about neural networks? So, a little bit. So essentially, it, it kind of, uh, the first level recognizes the really low level features, and then each level after that is a higher abstraction. So maybe like the first network recognizes individual pixels, and then the second level starts to recognize features. Maybe like all of these pixels form a face, and all of these pixels form uh, a shirt, or a thread, or whatever, things like that. Uh, for these networks to give you the right behavior, you need to feed them a lot of data with different contexts. Like, here's what a, a threaded shirt looks like in the fall, and in the winter, and in the summer, uh, with good lighting background, and bad lighting. Uh, it, it, but to generate all of these permutations, it takes a lot of time and processing power. So in order to solve that problem, we figured out ways that we're patenting to generate our own data. So from a few images, what we call a sparse data set, we can get a complete data set without having to download the packages. So that was kind of a, a, a nice result uh, from facing these challenges. Other issues is continuous style changes. So how long do you think for an outfit, uh, how long is it trending once it comes out? Kind of guesses. You work for the industry. <laughs> no, it's very close. It's about one and a half months. So one and a half months, if I need millions of images to train a high accuracy model, and I need to do this every one and a half months, that sucks. Uh, so it becomes a, a real cost issue because the training needs to happen on GPUs, consumes a lot of power um, to download the images. They have bandwidth costs, they have infrastructure costs, things like that. The, the differences across each style are also pretty significant. Like if you were to enumerate the, the fashion attributes of the things that you're wearing, long sleeve, short sleeve, uh, v-neck, circular neck, uh, maybe like the, the pocket on the shirt is on the right side or the left side, maybe it has a zipper or it doesn't. It's too granular. There are thousands of permutations of, of things that, uh, that, that you need to train a system on. And it gets even more complicated when you try to incorporate things like makeup 
or hairstyles, or shoes, or pads, or even worse, all of the above. <laughs> it gets very complicated. Uh, to do that, you need to do something we call labeling. So labeling, we go and hire thousands of people to look at these millions of images and start saying, this is a female that is wearing a short sleeve, and a short, uh, maybe a sweater, or you know, whatever, jacket, uh, with red lipstick. Etc. Etc. So that these labeling tasks, you can use something called Amazon Mechanical Turk to farm them out uh, for pennies an image. But even though it's cheap, uh, millions of images, it gets costly pretty quickly. And if you have to do this every one and a half months, <laughs> you know, you see how the complexity uh, grows even more. And and then, you, more importantly, how are you going to personalize this <coughs> to your customers? So when you walk into Macy's or North Storm or any of these uh, stores, there's a lot of inventory, tons of choices, tons of options. Uh, you might have a pretty good idea of what you want, but then you're not finding it exactly. The, the trend in the future, even Amazon is working on physical stores to sell all of, you know, all of the stuff that they sell. Why? The reason they have so much information about you, so they can make sure by the time you go to the store, they optimize your shopping experience. This instant gratification aspect that we get online, you know, I go to a URL, I type it, bam, I get a page. I don't go to Macy's, bam, I get an outlet. That's, that's what the experience should be. You know, if, if I'm there in the store, physically, I, I'm taking the effort to do the trick, I might as well find what I want. And that's what it should be. You could do that with AI if you know your user really well. Now, knowing the user and getting all of this data is, is very hard. It's much easier to infer the information rather than doing it with surveys. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about a company called Stitch Fix. In order to use it, you have to fill like a long survey, and uh, they want to understand your style and look at your outfits and things like that. Okay. So, uh, the last challenge, which is with some insider information from different companies that are trying computer vision AI to do matching and personalization and, and uh, discovery and recommendations, etc. Let's fix it. companies that are using AI, they're not noticing a good ROI of the investment. This is where you know rubber hits the road. If, if I'm going to use all of this technology and do the labeling and the training and the infrastructure, etc., 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 is it going to benefit my bottom line? Uh, the truth is so far, especially in retail and fashion specifically, based on what I know, People are not making money just yet. There is there's a lot more gaps to be filled. Uh, and that's why as a company, we actually chose not to. There are other startups that are looking in, in this area. And I'm gonna try to finish up quickly and we'll have more of a discussion. So I mentioned Stitch Fix. Looks like some people already knew about it. Who's using it already? Actually, they were a speaker at the last meetup. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so they're using, uh, they're using something called human-assisted AI. So it, it, there's like a middleman that helps the machine uh, make, make the suggestions. And that speeds up the process, but they still have to employ people to help fix things for you. And there's another company called View.ai. They are looking at the full picture. So when you do the full picture, that's when you actually make money. They're not trying just to sell you a dress. They want to sell you the lipstick and the backpack and the shoes and the underwear and you know the whole the whole package. Uh, and they're looking at also some some other things. If you visit the website, you'll see uh, some of the interesting things that they're doing. And uh, finally, there is another one called Fred Genius. Uh, these guys are are in it to to master it. So like they are actually investing all of the people to go and label and look at all of the granular differences needed to understand fashion. So if you, 
this is like a really busy image where some of the vectors that they're looking at, is it a beaded neck? I don't even know what that means. Illusion neckline, uh, sweetheart, <laughs> strapless dress, etc. Uh, they come up with these labels and annotations. Funny enough, when you ask people to do these labels, most people don't know what these labels are because there is no unified taxonomy. Like most people, when they like a dress, they say, oh, I just like this dress. They won't tell you, oh, I like it because it has a sweetheart type v-neck. <laughs> Who knows what that means? Uh, but investing all of that effort increased their quality significantly. So when they make recommendations, you don't actually know why it, it, you like it, but you do. Uh, because based on what they learned about you, it, this, is, this is something that you'd like. And with that, uh, I, I didn't jump into a lot of technical detail, but hopefully that was useful. Okay, take questions, yeah? Um, so I don't know if you really mentioned in the beginning, so what does your application do? What is it looking to fill? Okay, so our application, we just did it unsupervised, so we didn't teach it label it any of these things. Uh, we look at the outfit that you take a picture of, and we just try to match it with our database. We did it as a demo for running the matching on the mobile device itself, rather than running it. So just a basic image search to find? Pretty the much, yeah. Uh, uh, there are other challenges that I didn't mention, uh, actually. When you take a picture of something, Sometimes the AI will get confused and start caring about the background rather than the outfit that you're looking at. And sometimes, if there are multiple people in the image, you won't know which one is trying to match mostly. So it's like a lot of these challenges are, are if, uh, when we try to market our app as we're the Shazam of clothing, but only works with Forever 21 and only works with 6,000 images with the whole data set, it didn't work because <laughs> it wasn't really doing that. Yeah. What database do you use to store all the images, and what algorithm do you use to, like, you know, compute the similarity between two images? Yeah. So we, we're doing the computation directly on the device. The we have uh, kind of narrowed down each image to a simple vector, and then we just do a dot product to to figure out the uh, the distance between all of the vectors available. We actually do uh, since you seem technical. Uh, we we do for every matching, we look at all of the 6,000 images and we just give you the top 10 results that look the closest. And we're using TensorFlow, but it's a very heavily modified version of TensorFlow to run directly on it. Yeah. I'm curious about kind of the decision making to go pivoting and finding out these different, some of the pitfalls that you, I guess you have found on the way. How did you know, how did you make the decision to avoid those rather than be deeper and solve those problems? That's a good question. So for us, having been at Google and, and I've been at startups in the past, most in the gaming industry, uh, I figured it down to, and all of my VC friends confirmed this, that for a technology startup, you need one of three things for a combination of, the, of those three. You need revenues, you need users, or you need technology. Uh, because none of us have any expertise in retail, and all of our contacts and networks have very strong expertise in, in actual AI and technology, it seemed that uh, optimization of our path is to focus on tech for the things that we know best. Getting users in retail, consumers specifically, is very, very hard. And getting people, or companies like Zara, Zara or Macy's, or Others requires to be kind of a little bit in the network to know how they operate. I mean, Brendan had his own company before he switched to this solution, so like he, he had that trouble firsthand. And we didn't feel that we can empathize with our customers. So that was one of the users. From a revenue perspective, we're more than happy to do more retail work if somebody pays us. Uh, but when we looked at what like people like Fred Genius have done and View, they've done a ton of labeling, annotation, granular feature, figuring it out, uh, and they had to run it constantly. That was a lot of effort that it didn't feel like that, that would benefit us. And uh, from a tech perspective, while there is a lot of issues, the problems are kind of well known, and they're not te technical problems. They're kind of setup issues. If you configure your data correctly, 
or if you train your laborers and annotators to do the training data correctly, you can, you can generate a high quality solution. Uh, but it's, there's no huge barrier to entry. Uh, where we ended up focusing now on doing video AI. Video, multiple frames per second, tracking things from frame to frame. We, we've been at Google, even the YouTube team is having a lot of issues indexing videos and knowing what these entities represent and how they move from frame to frame. And that technology benefits several other domains from self-driving cars to, to security, to uh, satellite imagery, to drone imagery, things like that. So this is a, bit, a, a more a longer answer than you expected, but hopefully it answers. It's important, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since your algorithm is unsupervised, how do you track and compute performance? Uh, good question. We don't actually care that much because the computation is happening on the device. Uh, we're not paying anybody on the cloud to, to do that for us. Uh, so that, that's one aspect. The other aspect where we would have cared if we are actually trying to build as a consumer product, then battery life, uh, performance, how much in, in memory are we consuming in the device and things like that. Uh, so if it was a real product, we, I would have a better answer, but right now, like, literally, we don't care. <laughs> yeah. So do you see this technology like being very service focused to like just clothing brands in general? I mean, once this technology comes out and got AI dictated, you know, kind of what best suits you, like what differentiates you from what you want? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think what will end up being the real differentiation is how human your service is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like seriously, you know, the best chatbots are the chatbots that actually really behave like a human. And what usually, uh, what you find out when you dig really, really deep is that there's a human <laughs> actually doing the responses, not, not a machine. Uh, that will change, you know, there's a bunch of people, there's a company called AI Brain in Palo Alto that's like working on a personality chatbot that, that even like cracks jokes and, and, and really forms its own personality. So sometimes it's mean, sometimes it's cocky, or, uh, and it's, it's persistent. So like if it's cocky, it's always cocky. And if it's uh, mean, it's always mean. But other uh, versions of the chatbot can pick randomly different personalities and form them. Uh, it does actually make huge problems or huge mistakes sometimes. Uh, mistakes that are big enough to be deal breakers. And the best AI would be the more human AI. Uh, I don't think we are exactly there yet, specifically for fashion, because there's a lot of other surrounding problems, you know, inventory management, uh, availability, uh, friendliness, uh, how long something is there, the age group of the people that you're targeting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, if, if you look at the whole ecosystem, uh, I think of it as, if somebody comes up with an, or with an Apple experience for fashion, right? Like it's easy to use, everything is well integrated, you don't need to go from place to place, and you can get just a, a seamless experience from start to end. That's what Vue.ai trying to do, uh, but they're still in the early days. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Uh, sort of like uh, the regular CNN. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, we did like a two two hidden layers and, and very very simple CNN because we we tried to make it also to fit within less than 50 megabytes of the device uh, with knowledge of all of the images. If we if we try to increase the number of images by a lot, then the executable will just get too big. Uh, I, I think the diversity of the data, yeah. yeah. Did that tie into kind of transfer learning? Uh, so transfer learning is, uh, we, we have a research project for doing transfer learning. The transfer learning is very computationally expensive. And to do it on the device directly is not a smart thing to do. It's better done with a desktop GPU. Uh, so then we would need to go to the cloud. 
and then our whole value proposition breaks <laughs> at that point. Uh, however, we are talking to some customers who, who don't care if transfer learning happens in the cloud. Um, and for those cases, uh, which actually, you know, for a lot of mobile apps, uh, that might be okay. Uh, then if you can have a continuous loop of whatever your customers are looking at, and then you can uh, get labels from the customer behavior, like this was a good result, this was a bad result. And nothing more complex, you know, if you try to do tagging or more complex stuff from your users, it's, you, you're not gonna get very high quality data. But if you have binary signals, like yeah, this matched my user, this didn't match my user. And you start formulating, <coughs> You start formulating personal models. Like each user has their own model that detects and knows what they like or what they don't like. You're you you're doing really good at that point. Yeah. So what we've seen, uh, if if you can, and, and there are some papers that have tried to do this, is to do guided learning. So it's it's not an RNN. Uh, exactly, but they just feed input to the different hidden layers to guide them along the process. So they make sure that the, each layer learns exactly what you want it to learn in each phase. And uh, funny enough, all of the guys that did this, uh, th the way they figured it out is by trial and error. So <laughs> there wasn't, you know, a lot of science. Like it, they figured that if you if you force the model to recognize gender first, you're a lot more likely to get high quality results at the end. And, and things like this. Yeah. Tell me those, those papers. <laughs> and there is a paper by, uh, I think the guy's name is Ahmad Kamar, he's the Thread Genius CTO. And, uh, he has a presentation on SlideShare. He cites a lot of these papers, so you can you know, get to it right away. Cool. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mo. coming. Uh, by the way, uh, for those of you who have been asking, my name is Evelyn. Uh, I'm the founder of a startup called eCloset.me. We, gener uh, we um, have um, uh, consumer-facing apps in fashion, and we generate reports based on demographic girl data um, and feed it back to brands. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming, and thanks again to uh, our speakers and uh, Stitch Labs for sponsoring uh, food and uh, Facebook for sponsoring the venue. Um, and hopefully, see you next time. Thanks.